All right. So we're continuing our verse by verse study through Paul's letters to the Thessalonians. And this week, Joe asked me, or which chapter we're in? We're still in chapter three, but Lord willing, we may be able to finish up chapter three today. We'll, we'll see. That's, that's the plan. So, uh, we, we've seen in, in particularly in this first half of the book, we've seen Paul's heart for these Thessalonian believers from the things that that we that he was saying to them, like we, you know, we talked about the telephone call, where you only hear one side of the conversation and you deduce what's being said on the other side by what the answers are or the, the things that's being said on your side. So uh, we can figure that by the things he was saying to them, we gather that some of the questions they were having or were being thrown at them, or they were questioning their own salvation. They, they may even have questions or accusations thrown at them that Paul doesn't care about you. He left and he left you, you know, with, with all this going on. And, and you know, on those cold, dark, weary nights, those things, they grow in your mind. They, 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 they feed on themselves. And so when, when do we question things the most? When, when do we really have questions? When we lay down at night. When we lay down at night, when, when, when we're tired, when just stuff is happening. I, 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 when I was writing that, I thought about, it's been said that we need to halt, H-A-L-T, we need to halt before we make any major decisions and ask, am I hungry, am I anxious, am I lonely, or am I tired? H A L T halt. I, I, I was, you know, it's a little bit of a rabbit trail. When I was writing that, working on that part of it yesterday, I thought of the story of Elijah. You know, whenever Jezebel threatened to kill him, and he, he's depressed, and he ran off, and what what did he do? God brought him to the juniper tree, and he took a nap, and then they brought him food. You know, so if if you if you're depressed, you need to take a nap and eat a snack. So. <laughs> That's supposed to help. But put yourself in their place. The more they thought these questions just kept getting hurled at them. They hadn't heard a word from Paul since he left. Their enemies and those, sometimes the enemies of your own household, throw these questions at you. And so they were struggling with that. But in these first three chapters, we see that those questions weren't true. As Paul gets this letter back to them, in fact, we saw last week that Paul was in such a dither about them that he was willing to be left alone in Athens in order for Timothy and Silas to go back. Timothy went back to the Thessalonians. Silas went back to the uh, to the Philippians. But he was willing to be left alone in this very hostile city and in order just to find out how they were getting along, how they were making it. And, and he, he wanted Timothy to go back and check on them and encourage them. So we, in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 3, Paul said, when, when we could stand it no longer, when we couldn't endure it any longer, we thought it best to be left behind at Athens alone, and we sent Timothy, our brother and God's fellow worker, <coughs> excuse me, in the in the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage you as to your faith. And he reminded them uh, that he had indeed told them, I told you there was going to be hard times. I told you we were going to go through this, verses 3 and 4. Don't, I told you not to be disturbed by these afflictions. I told you they were going to happen, and, and sure enough, they did happen. <clears throat> And then, and then we see, and we got to, to verse 5, we see the other bookend of this. For this reason, when I could endure it no longer. It wasn't when we could endure it no longer, but I could endure it no longer. I had to have, I, I had to have some help. I had to know. And so we see that not only did the Thessalonian believers, not only did they need encouragement, but Paul needed encouragement as well. And I, th I think this is a very important point. <clears throat> we all need encouragement at different times. And one of the, the things, uh, a quote that, that uh, 
I reckon it's original. I've never heard anybody else say it. But I've always said that everybody in the world thinks that everybody else in the world has it all together. But in fact, none of us do. You know, when particularly I think about, you know, when, when you're in high school and there's there's the, the popular kids and it's just like everybody's got it together. They don't have the problems I and even, you know, the rest of life. They don't have the problems that I have. They don't have the struggles that I have. Well, when you get to know people, we all have those areas that we're uncomfortable in, that we don't feel as sure in, that we have the areas where we are comfortable, where we do know what we're doing, but then there are other areas that's just like, I, I'm just, I'm all thumbs when it comes to this. So everybody, we all need encouragement at different times. Actually, the more I've studied Paul over the years, the more I really think that Paul suffered from discouragement. Many times, you know, if anybody had it together, it was Paul. No, if you read, read his letters carefully, if you read Acts carefully, and you see the number of times where he will say something about this happened or that happened, or as Luke's writing Acts, and it encouraged Paul. Well, how are you encouraged if you weren't first discouraged and, and, and I think that's that Paul struggled with that all along so how do we do that how, how do we really encourage people I mean is it more than just an attaboy now and then have you ever thought about that I mean, we, we talk so often about our friend Gina and how encouraging she is we talked a little bit last time about the gift of encouragement but even if that's not your <coughs> quote spiritual gift we still need to be encouraging, but how do you do that? Be specific in, in what you're thinking, mm -hmm. you know, like area, the yeah. area that you want to encourage somebody or say you do good at that. Yeah, yeah. Appreciate. Appreciate. That's that's the thing. It's, it's, it's more, I think, than just encouragement, but it's the appreciation. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I think we all we all need that. We all crave that to know that we're doing the right things. Do you feel like somebody's actually took the time to get to know you? Yeah, exactly. It's not just a lot of words. It's somebody actually has took the time to see you as who you are. Yeah, you know. yeah, exactly. That that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of putting it that way, but 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 that is it. When you get to know someone, and and the, the door is kind of opened, then. To share your struggles. That one particular lady comes to mind of, in one of our Bible study groups. I've known her, you know, went to high school, known her all these years. But over this past year, through a very difficult situation in their family, gotten to know her a lot better. So where, you know, you feel like you can open up with her, but she's opened up to me and shared some of the personal struggles. Whereas on the surface, you think, oh, they wouldn't have a problem in this world. That's not true for any of us. We've, we've all got those here. But that, I think we see that with Paul and particularly these Thessalonian believers. Now, you can read Philippians and read all these other letters. And he had a close connection with the other churches that he started. But I don't remember of having this close of a connection that he has with these Thessalonian believers. But anyway, we pick up this week with verse 6. And we see how Paul encouraged them. Uh, verse 6 says, But now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love. So stop right there. We saw back in, in, in chapter 1, as Paul began the letter, he was thankful for what he called uh, in, in verse 3 of their work of faith and their labor of love. He was thankful from that from the very beginning. But then he goes on in more detail as he goes along just what that means. This good news that Timothy brought to Paul was that they are standing on their faith. They're standing by their faith. They're standing on their faith. And we quoted last time that that uh, originally was spoken in the book of Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. And we saw that there, there's two ways of looking at that. We tend to, and I think it's because of the way Paul uses it in Romans, we tend to look at that as the just, 
The righteous man will live in eternity, will have eternal life because he has faith. And that's true. But the way Habakkuk uses it, and also the way it's used in, in Hebrews, is that the righteous man will survive because of his faith. And when we look around us today and the things that are going on, and we think, how are we going to survive? And it's by our faith for our life here and now, but also in the life to come. Uh, here and now when there are trials and afflictions as Paul is talking about. Then he goes on and we see how the Thessalonian believers encourage Paul. So the rest of that verse says, well, let me just read, now, now that Timothy has come to us from you and has brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always think kindly of us, longing to see us just as we also long to see you. And uh, every time I read that, I think, it, and I don't even remember when it happened, but and it's been used a lot of times in commercials, and then Sally feels like, they like me, they really like me. <laughs> Paul would say, they really do like me, they love me as much as I love them. And, but they wanted to see Paul as much as Paul wanted to see them. And then in verse 7, he says, for this reason. For what reason? Well, for the fact that Timothy has brought Paul the good news that they were working out their faith. Now, that doesn't mean they were figuring it out, working it out. It means they were working it. They were doing it. They, they were living it out, and they were laboring in their love. And in spite of Paul's distress and affliction, the rest of verse 7, for this reason, brethren, in all our distress and affliction, we were comforted about you, through your faith. Paul says, in all that I was going through, knowing that you were standing strong, encouraged me. And and I think about this, I, th I think more about, uh, about our children when, uh, in my personal case, when I know they are doing well, when I know they are standing strong, when I know they are dealing with struggles well, that encourages me. Because otherwise I'm worrying about them. Are they going to make it? So, oh, they're making it. Okay, I can breathe now. Just Paul will say that actually. Now I can breathe because they're they're standing. But I I think we all feel that way about our families. And so Paul was, you know, we, earlier in the letter he talks about being orphaned. So there, there's that family connection that he has with it. But what's really interesting for this is what Paul is talking about here. <clears throat> I was encouraged. I was comforted uh, in, in all that I was going through, in all our distress, and all my distress, and all my affliction. I was comforted by you. Well, what's really interesting about that is you've you got two things going on here. You've got, you've got the letter he is writing to them about the distress and the affliction he's going through. That's all he says about it, distress and affliction. But if you look in Acts, you actually see real, real time actually what's going on. Uh, let, let me just read that, that quick. What he's talking about there, this is what's happening in Acts 18 beginning verse 1. So Luke is telling the story. Luke's telling the narrative. Luke says after these things, after he'd been run out of Thessalonica and, and Berea and all that, Paul left Athens and went uh, and then what happened in Athens? Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And when he got to Corinth, he found a certain Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, and recently coming from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Well, Priscilla, we know that story. Claudius, the, the Caesar, had, had run them out of Rome, and so they were there in Corinth. And he goes on to say, because Paul was of the same trade of Aquila and Priscilla, he stayed with them. They worked together. But, verse 5, uh, when Silas and Timothy came, they'd been up in the north area, they came down, they came to Ma uh, came from Macedonia, then Paul began devoting himself completely to the word. They had brought funds, they had brought encouragement. But, you know, Paul now, this second wind that we're going to read about Paul getting, this is where he got it. Got that second wind now, and he can go on. And in verse 6 of Acts 18, and when they... Oh, well, well, let me back up. He was, he was preaching to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. And when they, the Jews, resisted and blasphemed, 
Paul shook off his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I'm going to the Gentiles. And he departed from there and went to the house of a certain man named Titus Justus, who was a Gentile worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So you just imagine this picture. Paul is in the synagogue. They won't listen to him. He says, I'm leaving and going to the Gentiles. And he goes next door. <laughs> I just always thought that was just such a comical scene. But that's what's happening when Paul is saying, in all of our distress and affliction, you comforted us. That's what, can you imagine, that's what gave him the courage. I'm leaving you. I know the Gentiles are going to listen. And he goes next door. So that's what he's saying here to the Thessalonians. That's the actual event that's taking place. Now, what we've got to remember is for every book in the Bible, everything that's written in the Bible, every writer that's writing, of course, it is God-breathed. It is, you know, Holy Spirit-inspired. But some person, some man is writing it, okay? For every man that's writing, he's living somewhere. He, something is going on in his life somewhere. He's dealing with something as he's writing. And we've seen that particularly as we've studied the prophets. But as Paul was writing this letter to the Thessalonians, he's engaging the Corinthians... In, in evangelism. He's getting some good news and he's getting some hard heads that he's running against. So, that, so that's what's going on. So then in verse 8 of First Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, we see, for now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. In other words, I can breathe now. I, I, I'm real, I can really live now, you can imagine this big sigh of relief that he felt there in Acts 18 when Silas and Timothy came back. I can live because of his, he was so consumed with concern for the Thessalonians believer and he was so relieved then when he got that good news from Timothy, it seemed like he could live again. It, it just, and I'm sure you've, you've felt this. Have you ever been so wrapped up in wanting to hear from someone that it seemed like you were almost, you were holding your breath? And then once you heard, it's just like, just this wash of relief just comes over you. So that's what Paul is feeling here, and he could breathe again. But, but, but here's a thought. Are we concerned that much about fellow believers? I think we've all felt that way about our family. But what about fellow believers who are going through affliction? You felt that same kind of concern for fellow believers who were in struggles or like this friend I was talking about and what they're going through have gone through this past summer. It just... Sometimes you just got to hear how are things going. So with Paul, it was more than just family. It was, these were his family. Now, what, I th several weeks ago, we said, who is it that we consider our brothers and our sisters? Jesus said, it is the one who does the will of my father. That's, that's our family. But then he adds, he adds something there in verse 8. For now we really live if you stand firm in the Lord. And I looked in several translations uh, last night at this. Some translations use the word since. And that, that, changes, that changes his sentence completely. For now we really live since you stand firm in the Lord. That's because you're doing it. But the word there, if... Is a conditional word. It's it's not it's not actually the word since. Since, since is not the best word there. If means if. I mean this is a conditional word. So what's it take for a Christian to stand firm in the well ask this first. Maybe I should ask first. Can a Christian fail to stand firm in the faith? Absolutely. It happens all the time. Yeah, ha <laughs> happens all the time. I, I, I said, sure they can, or maybe I should say, sure I can. So what's it take for a Christian to stand firm in the faith? How do we do that? Because we've all 
feel like we've not stood firm in the faith at times, or we've not been, and, and I don't mean faithful in the sense of doing the right things. I mean faithful in, in the sense of having faith. How do we do it? I don't think it's just one thing. I, I think it's the intimate yeah. knowledge of the Word. Yeah. Standing on the front, knowing the Word of God and standing on it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, if you don't have anything to guide you, how are you going to stand on something? Yeah. If you don't have any rules yeah. or ideas about what you're supposed to stand firm on. Right. Right. That, that reminds let me let me... I didn't have this in my notes, but let me read this in. Cause this, you know, we well, all the time we hear Romans eight twenty eight. God causes all things to work together for good. That whole verse. What comes before that? In that verse, Paul has been talking about. Let me, let me verse. Go back to verse twenty six. Well. You can go back, back, back. <laughs> Verse 24, For in hope we've been saved. But hope that is not seen is not hope. For why, why does one hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, that's perseverance. The same way. The Spirit helps us. The Spirit helps carry the load, helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should. We, we've heard that verse. You may not realize that went with this. But the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit helps us stand. He who searches our hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because He intercedes for us, for the saints according to the will of God. And then we come to verse 28. And this is how verse 28 begins. And we know that God calls us all to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. I think that first phrase is the most powerful part of that verse. And we know. That's what gives us the strength. And we know we can count on Scripture. And we know that God's Word is true. And we, But if we don't know, then, then we don't have that to help us stand firm in the Lord. And what Paul is saying here in verse 8, if you stand firm in the Lord, you've got to stand. He's not talking about losing their salvation. We, we know uh, we know that, that a Christian can fail to stand. We know this from Ephesians 6 verses 11 through 14 where Paul is encouraging, as you remember, the Ephesian believers to put on the whole armor of God. And he says... Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And he goes on to explain why. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual weakness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore. Three times in, in, uh, in four verses, he, he says, stand. It must be important to stand if he keeps repeating that. He wasn't afraid, as I said, that the Thessalonian believers would lose their faith. He wasn't afraid that they would lose their salvation. What he was afraid of was that they would fail to stand in that faith. Hold on to that faith. Stand firm in the Lord. The word that's used in Ephesians 6 to stand means an immovable fixed position. Don't let them wiggle you one side or the other. But the word here means to persevere. It means to go on and to keep on standing. It's, it's in the continuous tense. Uh, the, the, as I said, the word is different in in 1 Peter 5 8, Peter warns the early church to be sober, to be vigilant, to be on guard, because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring white lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Stand firm. Don't let him move you from side to side. Paul had already warned them about the adversary twice, called him the tempter uh, in verse 5. Tell him, and then he goes back and says that Satan thwarted him, hindered him from coming to them earlier. 
But the phrase stand firm, as I said here in verse 8, is more than just a fixed position. It means to persevere. Perseverance is different than endurance. Endurance is, is just you know, standing up as it, as it happens. Perseverance is taking steps forward, going against it. It's, it's active. It's taking an active stance in standing firm. It's not just standing firm while bad things are happening to you. I'm holding on to my faith. I'm standing firm. No, it's taking active steps, being proactive in standing. Then verses 9 and 10 are, are one sentence, but we'll break that down into two. He says, uh, for, for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we rejoice before God on your account? We saw back, um, uh, he, he's received this good news that they're standing. He's relieved that they're standing. I will continue to be relieved as long as I know that you're standing. And so then he asked this rhetorical question. What can, what thanks can we render to God? I mean, how can I thank God for how well you're doing? How, how can I thank God for the relief that, that I feel? And we saw back in verse two of chapter one that Paul prayed for them, that prayed continuously for them. He thanked God for them. He thanked, uh, that, that God had, had, had shown him how they were standing, how, had shown God, or had, excuse me, had shown Paul such great grace in God's caring for them. Paul was receiving grace because God had had helped the Thessalonians. And, and as I was thinking about that, I thought, did you know that as a child of God, when you pray for someone else, the answer for them is actually can be counted as grace or a gift to you. We see that in one particular instance I could think of when Moses prayed for the Israelites. Moses, you know, how they grumbled. And, well, he prayed for them many times. But one particular instance, Moses said to God, if I have found favor, or if I found grace in your sight, forgive these people. I know they've done wrong. I know they're grumbling. But if I've found any favor in your sight at all, please forgive them. And God did. God forgave them. He didn't forgive the Israelites because they deserved it, because they certainly didn't, but he forgave them because Moses prayed for them. The gift, the answer, was a gift to Moses that God answered his prayer for, for these Israelites. So, so Paul is saying here, what thanks can we, can we render to God? Or the word render literally means to pay back. How can I give back to God for what he has done? And you think of the song, how can I say thanks for the things that you've done for me? If you've ever received, if you've ever been praying earnestly about a situation and you got the answer or you heard that the situation uh, that it had worked out or that somebody was healed or that somebody was doing better or that they were standing in the faith or whatever the answer was, if you ever just fell to your knees and thanked God for that, I mean, that, that is such such a, a relief. Just, you, 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 can't, you can't stay standing when you get an answer like that. And, and and Paul was saying, uh, how can I thank God for that? We may say, how can I thank you for this answer? How how what can I do? How can I serve you more? How what what can I do, Lord? You have been so good, man. The number of times that I mean, Joe and I will talk about. You know, why does He bless us the way He does? Why does He answer prayer? Why why do we why do we have this relationship? It's not on our part. How can we give back to God for this? And we, we think about that. It's not that, that we owe God, but we want, you, you want to do something. You can't, we've said many times, you can't outgive God. God gave first. 
And then we want we keep wanting to serve him be, not so that he will bless us, as you hear a lot of times. You know, you do this and God will bless you. No, he's already blessed us. How can we serve him? How can we be faithful to him? Because he has blessed us so much. He's already blessed us so much. So Paul, Paul's pondering that. Yeah, what, what can I do? How, how can I how can I thank God for this good news that Timothy's brought me? And so he begins to tell them how much he's been praying for them. He goes on with, with verse 10. Um, well, for what thanks can we render to God for you in return for all the joy with which we, we rejoice before our God on your account as we night and day keep praying for you. We keep praying, keep praying more earnestly. So he's thinking about how to, how to thank God, how to pray for these Thessalonian believers who, who've encouraged him so much. And he tells them that how he's praying for them. And he says, we're praying most earnestly for you. Now that word earnestly is, in my translation, it's a superlative word. It's it's the, the mostest, mostest. I mean, you know, that's not proper English for us, but it's like how many times can you add most or add, or add EST to something? It's, it's the most that you can imagine. That same, that same word or that same thought is also found in Ephesians 3.30 where it describes how God is able to answer prayer. You may remember that. It says he is able to do it exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or think. Not just exceedingly, but exceedingly abundantly, exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask and all that you can think up. And that's the same word that you used here. And where is that found? That Ephesians 3.30, when Paul is praying for, for the Ephesians and praying that it's it's a it's a progressive prayer. This happens, so this happened, so this happened, so this happened. And then now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. But but that's what Paul is praying here. He's praying exceedingly abundantly for what? And then he lists several things. He actually has a prayer list here that he prays for. First of it, uh, first of all, in verse 10, he says that, first of all, he wants to see them. We keep praying night and day, most earnestly, that we may see your face. We just want to see your face. And then he says, and that we may, com we may complete what is lacking in your faith. So in other words, Paul, Paul wants to complete their education. It's not that they don't have enough faith. It's that he needs to um, complete their education. The word complete there is where it says, we may complete what is lacking in your faith. That, that word complete there is actually a picture. It's a word that means repair. But it's a picture of like repairing nets. When you talked to, when I, I think, not positive on this, but I think in the Gospels where Peter and the disciples were repairing their nets that morning that Jesus came to them, I think that's the same word. But it's the picture of fixing something or rearranging something um, it, 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 or adjust. It wasn't that something was wrong with their faith that needed repairing. Perhaps it just needed a little rearranging. Or a little enlarging upon. I mean, they knew this much, but they needed to know this much. Uh, it, it, a little filling in the gaps. It, like that verse in Romans 8, 28. We, to, to know that verse, for we know that all things work together, is important. Or all things work together. But it's that, that beginning part, and we know, that fills in the gaps of the power of that verse. So many verses in Scripture that we may have memorized, but we and you know how I am about context. If you go back and you read the rest of the verse or what comes before it, it just adds so much more. So that's what Paul's wanting to do. He wants to go back and fill in the gaps that they need in, in their faith. Leading someone to salvation is not a once and done deal. It is in the sense that you only need to get saved once, but 
it, it, it's it's in the sense that th there is a growth process. Uh, someone who has just come to the Lord is a baby Christian. I don't care how old they are. You know, we talked earlier uh, in another lesson about how young Timothy was, but Timothy was more mature in the faith than these elderly by age people that he was teaching. And so it was, you, you can't just take, you, you don't bring a baby home from the hospital and say, you know, go make you a sandwich when you get hungry. <laughs> you know, there's the filling in the gaps. There's the teaching. There's the leading them along. We've talked before about equipping others for service in the church. <clears throat> in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, Paul will tell when he writes the Ephesian believers that Jesus gave, Jesus made a, a, gave a gift to the church. And that gift was, he, Jesus, gave some as apostles, some as prophets to the church, gave to the church some apostles, gave to the church some prophets, gave to the church some evangelists, and gave to the church some pastors and teachers. Why? For the equipping of the saints to do the work of ministry. If you're not equipped, I don't care what the job is, if you don't have, first of all, if you don't have the right tools, and then you don't have the knowledge to use those tools, it doesn't do you a lot of good. So someone has to teach how to do that. That's what Sunday school is for. That, that is what Bible studies are for, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So Paul's concern for these Thessalonian believers was that they were lacking something in their spiritual faith. And the rest of this letter, chapters 4 and 5, will show us what he's going to teach them. What The rest of the letter will be about the teaching, what they needed to know to fill in these gaps. And I think you'll be amazed at some of the things that, that Paul will teach them. <clears throat> so many Christians today are ignorant of the truths of Scripture. First of all, they're not, they're not walking with the Lord. They don't have a prayer life. No one cares that they don't have a prayer life. I mean, has anyone asked you lately about your prayer life? Have you asked anyone lately about their prayer life? John Wesley was known for asking people, how is it with your soul? We don't do that. We don't ask, first of all, because we don't think of it. Second of all, when we do think of it, we don't want to embarrass anyone. We don't want them asking us that either. How is it with your prayer life? So one, one neat quote that I ran across as I was studying for this said, to start the day without prayer is saying in effect, I can handle today by myself. No, I can't. I, can't. I mean, that really hit me. If we don't start our day with prayer, we're saying, oh, it's okay, Lord, I got this. No, we don't. Paul spent likely hours praying for these Thessalonian believers. In it. And again, we can't change the culture until the hearts are changed, until Scripture is taught. So think about this. How, First of all, are we genuinely concerned about others? <clears throat> are we concerned about indifference? Are we concerned about the unsaved and the misguided? Are we really concerned about that? Probably not as much as we need to be. Right. I mean, yeah, yeah. If we're really honest, if we say, oh yeah, I'm concerned, well then the next part of that comes how? What do we do about it? As we're studying, Betty, it's making me think of uh, Paul as the man he is, the man he was, and then now the man he is. Mm -hmm. And it's just... Oh, it's blowing my mind to see the change. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just a dramatic here and then here. Yeah, yeah. And that's just kind of overwhelming yeah. when you really think about uh, all that he did before. Right. And now all that he's doing now. Yeah, yeah. And wonder if he... Pondered what he used to do. Oh yeah, when uh, if I you think read that would cause him to have a struggle. Yeah, discouraged. Yeah, discouraged yeah. I, I think himself. that was a big part of. It. I, I think it's in Second Timothy, 
where he, he spends, um, not, not a whole chapter, but several verses explaining, or I guess confessing, uh, Timothy probably already knew it, but but now we know it because of that. What kind of man he really was. There, I, I, I forget the word. There, there's one word that he uses that talks about what he did. And it, it, the word means not only did he have people killed, but he took great delight in it. Oh. And he said, forgetting what lies behind and pressing on to the yeah. mark of the high calling yeah. cross. Right. I, I think when he's... He, when he lays down at night in the middle of the night, I'm, I've often wondered if he heard the if he heard the screams and the cries of yeah. those people. That yeah. Well, God could take all that away. Yeah. God yeah. could take all that. You know, but I don't think God takes the memory of that away. I mean, he well, certainly he could. I believe he could. Yeah. But but because of what Paul says in other letters, I, I, I think <clears> you're right. I think he thought about that. And that gave him more of an incentive to do the right thing. Exactly. Because I know what the wrong is. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. he could he had all the example of the wrong. Mm-hmm. And he had done it. Yes. And so, so now don't you think he had a I've got to make up for this or you know Yeah, you know, there, there is a sense of that as, as we said a moment ago, we know we can't pay back. God for all that He's done for us, but when He says, "How can what thanks can we render to God?" I think there is a sense of that when when you realize what God has done for you, how He has directed you, how He has helped you. I mean, take any number of scenarios in any of our lives that, that we've really felt God's presence. You have this sense of no, you can't you can't pay Him back. But you have this sense of, I just want to serve him that much more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, we, we just, and, and I think that that's what he's saying here. So he, he prays this. He he prays, may may uh, may we we want to see your face. May God allow us to see your face. May may we be able to complete. May we be able to enlarge on, teach, fill in the gaps of what of what you don't know. And and then he, he's concerned with their equipping. But this prayer, but his prayer requests don't stop there. He, as he's praying, and, and Paul gets specific. Verse eleven. Now, may here's another uh, request, another his prayer request. May God, our uh, may our God and Father Himself and Jesus our Lord direct, and that word direct means to set a straight course, direct our way to you. And in verse 12, and may, another request, may the Lord cause you to increase and abound in love for one another, uh, and not only for one another, for fellow believers, but for all men. I think it's in, I think it's in Galatians where he says something to the effect of, of, um, love everyone, but especially those of the household of God. And here he's saying it in the opposite way. Do this for your fellow believers. Love your fellow believers, but love others too. Uh, to um, increase and abound in love for one another and for all men, just as we also do for you. That word abound there is, is another superlative word. It means to superabound in love. Love, of course, is the, is the word agape here. We know that. We know about agape. But the word agape literally means wanting God's best for another person. One dictionary put it this way. It involves God doing what he knows is best for man and not necessarily what man desires. It doesn't have anything to do with feeling. Yeah, right. It's doing the right thing. God, you know... When we love someone with agape love, we may actually be in direct opposition to what they want. What they think they want. But we want God's best for them, which ultimately is eternity with Him. But Paul is saying that that what he wants these Thessalonians to do, he wants them to love each other and all others and, and the same way that he loves them. So what's the result of that? The result is 
verse 13, so that he, God, may, another request, may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. So Paul is praying here that God will establish their hearts. And again, that it means to set firmly in place, to set in stone, we might say. That's the same word as strengthen. If we go back to verse 2, where Timothy came to strengthen them, to set them in stone, to, to establish them in what they believe. Timothy was sent to strengthen and encourage them. In verse 2, it was to set them firm in their faith. Here is to set their hearts firm and unblameable. I think about that word a minute. Unblameable. That, that you're not blamed for anything. That you couldn't be blamed. That you couldn't be blamed for it. Irreproachable, faultless in holiness. He wants you to be unblameable. He wants you to be irreproachable. Can't have anything said about you. He wants you to be faultless in holiness. But he wants that to happen for a specific time. So before we talk about what that specific time is, we have to refer to, <clears throat> we, we think about, he wants to set their hearts in that. So the word there actually is the word cardia from where we get, you know, cardiogram, or any, any cardio, anything having to do with the heart. But as a friend of ours says, is he talking about your blood pumper? <laughs> does, he, does he want your blood pumper to be perfect? What, is, what, is heart, what does heart mean in Scripture? When you want you to do something in your heart, or you want your heart to be this way? Your soul. Your soul, but what, what it, more than just your soul. Your whole being. Your whole being. Yeah. When we think of that scripture, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Heart is your emotions. That's why we put on the breastplate of righteousness. It protects our emotions. It protects our heart, which protects our emotions. Uh, Paul is referring to the inner man, our, our being. He wants our being to be without blame and in holiness. Why? At the coming of our Lord Jesus with all the saints. And here again we see Paul, it ends a section, or in this case a chapter, a thought, with talking about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did that at the end of chapter 1, he did it at the end of chapter 2, and now we have it at the end of chapter 3. It, it, the, the, the coming, the parousia of Christ. And commentaries disagree here on whether Paul is speaking of the rapture of the church or he's speaking of the second coming. Everywhere else, again, you think about the context. What's it mean everywhere else it's used? Everywhere else it's used in this book, he's speaking of the rapture. Okay, so, so it's the rapture, but look at what he says. He says it, that phrase, he's, uh, at the coming of our Lord Jesus with his saints. Now we know we know that when Christ returns in his second coming, as we read about Revelation 19, that he will come with the saints or with the holy ones. That's in Zechariah 14, 15. It's a prophecy. It's in Jude 1. Uh, Jude's just one chapter, but verse 14 says he comes with the saints. So that, that verse always perplexed me. It appears to be at the second coming. But everywhere else it's used, it talks about the rapture. So I was thinking about it and thinking about it and just reading it and reading it. But when you read it very carefully, when we read this verse, where it says, at his coming with the saints. Coming where? Our mind automatically thinks, coming here. But where is he coming? Where does it say he's coming to? Unblameable in holiness, before whom? God. Before God. Where's God? Heaven. In heaven. It doesn't because speak. Of our death. Maybe. That, but uh, it is speaking of the rapture because what it's talking about is taking us, his coming is coming to God. It he's is coming not coming here. He's coming there. there with us, bringing us there at the rapture. And when I realized that, 
you know, one of those mind blown things. So I'm, I'm convinced again, Paul is speaking of the rapture. But what does it, what does it mean to be unblameable in holiness? I mean, what's that look like? That's what we'll get into as we go into chapter four. Unblameable in holiness. So. Well, he makes reference to that also in Colossians. Unblameable in holiness? Yeah, you, you can approach God blameless and, um, and righteously yeah. and blameless. So and that's holy. exactly what that is. Yeah, very first good. Chapter, Colossians. Huh? The first chapter yeah. of Colossians. Yeah, first chapter. Very, yeah. All right. Anything else? Any thoughts? All right, well, we'll pick up next week with chapter four. So let's pray. I think that's a great lesson. I've gotten so much out of this lesson. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for 